welcome viewers. It is about thromboprophylaxis in obstetrics and gynecology. So, without wasting any time, let us just go into the subject straight away. How do we approach this subject? It is important because we had not heard about this subject in a big way earlier because many of it was not being diagnosed. And why? Because even if it was diagnosed, it was too late. You would have seen them in the mortuary and it would be in a post-mortem. It would be a massive embolus and finally, the person would be dead before a post-mortem would have picked it up with an embolus in the lungs and of course, a massive hemorrhage in the brain. So, our approach must be preventive, it should be judicious and pragmatic and not problematic. Something that would look at it as to how we can look at factors that we can actually look at preventing thrombosis rather than trying to treat thrombosis. So, what could be the frequently answered questions? What do we have to look at? Do all obese women require thromboprophylaxis? Is art a risk factor for venous thromboembolism? How do we decide for antenatal and postnatal thromboprophylaxis? Are Indians more prone to this risk? Is thromboprophylaxis post gynecological surgery is needed? Can caesarean section add to the risk of venous thromboembolism? Let us go into the facts now and take each one at a time. The relevance and implications of venous thromboembolism is that it affects almost 1 to 2 for every 100 pregnancies and it is also 10 to 15 percent of deaths during pregnancy and puerperium worldwide. So, that is a very significant number and we cannot afford to forget. Prevalence of deep vein thrombosis in patients undergoing major gynecological surgery ranges anywhere between 15 to 40 percent. Now, that is a very wide range, but nevertheless it all depends on the pre-morbid conditions. So, ve venous thromboembolism is not considered rare in India anymore. Pulmonary embolism is more suspected than a diagnosis. So, let us look at this case study that brings to the forefront as to how it could be managed. A 33 year old pregnant woman presented to the emergency department with shortness of breath and thoracic pain in the left side of the and increased with inspiration. She had been to the hospital 10 days earlier in Italy because of vaginal bleeding in the 15th week of her third pregnancy. Ultrasound revealed a small retroplacental hematoma with normal vital signs of the fetus. She had been immobilized for about 3 days and the bleeding had subsided. She had not received thromboprophylaxis. That is what you must remember. After hospital discharge, she had travelled back to the Netherlands, a 12 hour trip by car and her previous medical history was uneventful. She had two uncomplicated pregnancies in the past and her family history was negative for venous thromboembolism. At physical examination, she appeared short of breath and in pain with respirations of 24 excursions per minute. Temperature was about 37.2 centigrade, blood pressure normal 110 by 70, regular and pulse of 98 beats per minute, no abnormalities and chest ex on chest examination. She had no symptoms or signs of DVT. First, a bilateral compression ultrasound of the legs was performed and showed normal compressibility of the femoral and the popliteal veins on both sides. Second, because there was no alternative diagnosis, a spiral CT scan was performed and revealed multiple bilateral pulmonary emboli. A patient was then treated twice daily with low molecular weight heparin in the doses of nadiropyrin. 7600 units 
twice daily for the first five days and while she was admitted to the obstetric ward her chest pain subsided for a few days but she remained somewhat short of breath throughout the pregnancy she had no recurrent vaginal bleeding and after hospital discharge she was treated with low molecular weight heparin once daily and nadiropyrin 15200 international units which she tolerated well apart from some mild bruising around the injection site she had adequate peak of anti xa levels throughout pregnancy and normal platelet counts so she went into spontaneous labor at the gestation age of 38 weeks and delivered a healthy newborn girl 22 hours after the last injection of low molecular weight heparin and the blood loss was estimated to be around 350 ml and low molecular weight heparin was restarted 12 hours after delivery a half daily dose of nadiropyrin of 7600 international units and a full dose 12 hours there thereafter in the once daily regime she preferred low molecular weight heparin continuation and over switching to vitamin k antagonist and stopped her anticoagulant therapy 6 weeks after delivery her shortness of breath had disappeared completely shortly after delivery and she did well in her follow up now what are the stories and what is the lessons learnt her timely diagnosis even though there was no past history and trying to pick it up well in advance so that she did not have to have a catastrophic pulmonary embolism where the mortality rate was very high so what if the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism was not done in a timely basis so risk and prophylaxis in obstetrics the trend in maternal mortality ratio whilst it has been going down it's somewhere around 140 now at 2015 but the rationale of thromboprophylaxis if you look at the direct causes of death while thrombosis and thromboembolism can be around 1.01 we still have a long way to go and we need to understand that this is on the increase venous thromboembolism in india is on the rise and one has to understand that this is something that we have to keep in mind as we go forward in treating women with pregnancy or in gynec surgeries the figure 1 distribution here shows that venous thromboembolism over time has been showing an increase and if you looked at all the surgeries on the right the pie diagram will show you that in the obstetric and the gynae this thing almost a fifth of them will be due to obstetric and gynae surgeries so if you were to sort of look at it it's a significant part of um, surgeries that take place in hospitals so one cannot forget that thromboembolism has to be looked at as a diagnosis both pre intra and post management of surgeries this has to be kept in mind very seriously so let's look at how we are going to look at the evolution of risk in obstetrics and gynecological population starts in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy and persists throughout most of the third trimester incidence during pregnancy and puerperium is similar but the daily risk is higher during puerperium due to its shorter duration the first 7 days after birth carries almost a 50% such thromboembolic events hospitalizations due to venous thromboembolism seems to have contributed an increase up to 17 and 47 percent respectively during pregnancy and puerperium 90% of dvt occurs on the left side and mostly in the pelvic veins and hence difficult to diagnose by conventional methods ovarian vein thrombosis has also been reported the future risks as we see right now is that in 4% of patients with 2 years of pulmonary embolism 
pulmonary hypertension develops. Post thrombotic syndrome is seen in as much as 42 percent of those who have had DVT and 24 percent of those who had had pulmonary embolism. So, limitations for prevention and treatment and the available guidelines pose uncertainty due to lack of evidence. Extrapolation of guidelines from the non-pregnant population may be a challenge and may not always be comprehensive. Pathophysiology of virus thromboembolism, pregnancy, post thrombotic state which is venous stasis, hypercoagulability and endothelial dysfunction. These are the three hallmarks which actually causes venous thromboembolism and let us look into details of this. Venous stasis, compression of the pelvic vessels and the inferior vena cava by the gravid uterus. Hypercoagulability is because of the physiological increase in factors 6, 7, 10 and 1 Willebrand factors, pi 1 and 2 fibrinogen etcetera with decrease in protein S which is a natural anticoagulant. Now, endothelial dysfunction again a very important factor defective trophoblastic invasion and also due to endothelial injury during labor and childbirth. Keeping these in mind the triad of venous stasis, hypercoagulability and endothelial dysfunction forms the basis of venous thromboembolism. What are the risk factors for the thromboembolism in pregnancy and puerperium? If you have to look at the pre-existing conditions in patients, a prior occurrence of VTE, a maternal age more than 35 years, pre-pregnancy BMI of more than 30, multiparity of more than 3, hereditary thrombophilias and of course, APLA syndromes, other comorbidities like cancer, autoimmune conditions, nephrotic syndromes, cardiac failure, large varicose veins and lifestyle modifications or lifestyle factors which is smoking, reduced mobility like paraplegia as well. So, what could be my preconditions of obstetrics like multiple pregnancy, preeclampsia, caesarean sections, prolonged labor, preoperative vaginal delivery or preterm labor and intrauterine fetal death and PPH. Other contributory factors dehydration, hyperemesis and OHSS, assisted reproductive technologies, prolonged hospitalization and immobility that is over 3 days of confinement into bed, systemic infections, long distance travel. Now, thromboprophylaxis could either be in the form of mechanical or pharmaceutical or both. So, what can we do here with mechanical? In this case, in two thirds of general surgery patients, but data scarce in pregnant patients. One is early ambulation. The second is elastic and pneumatic compression used as adjuvants. Promote increase in venous flow, reduce venous stasis by causing a decrease in the size of the femoral vein. Now, what about the pharmacoprophylaxis? No role in routine prophylaxis, risk stratification system is very critical here, no RCTs to substantiate, but it is proven beyond doubt that there are proven benefits due to thromboprophylaxis to prevent recurrence risk of venous thromboembolism. So, what about the heparins? Enhanced actions of antithrombins that is endogenous and anticoagulant do not cross the placenta and are not secreted in breast milk. But there are some myths about it. Low molecular weight heparin are not as efficient as unfractionated heparins that is UFH. Prophylactic dose can increase risk of fractures and osteoporosis or osteoporosis. Heparin induced thrombocytopenia needs to be frequently monitored. Note. Heparins must be stopped about 24 hours before a proposed vaginal delivery or a scheduled caesarean section. Now, we will have to look at this slide very carefully and I want all my viewers to concentrate on this slide a little more carefully.
The table 1 shows thromboprophylaxis regimen with low molecular weight heparin doses calculated by weight and if the weight is less than 50 kilos the enoxapyrin is 20 milligrams per day and the daltipyrin is 2500 units per day. If the person is between 50 to 90 kilos then the enoxapyrin will be doubled and so also the daltipyrin. If the person is between 91 to 130 kgs it will be tripled and so also the daltipyrin. If the person is more than 170 kilos then it is 0.6 milligrams per kg per day and 75 international units per kg per day. High prophylactic dosage for women between 50 to 90 kilos which will be 40 milligrams per 12 hours per 12 days. 5000 international units per 12 hours. Now the table 2 will show us the thromboprophylaxis during pregnancy with low molecular weight heparin according to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. The prophylactic regimen would be enoxapyrin of 40 milligrams subcutaneous once a day and the daltipyrin will be 5000 international units subcutaneous once a day. The intermediate dosage will be 40 and the daltipyrin will be 5000. The adjusted dosage will of course be enoxapyrin of 1 milligrams per kg per day and 200 international units per kg per day. Some researchers advocate customized institutional protocols, routine platelet count monitoring not recommended to those on low molecular weight heparin, twice daily regimens were more preferred to achieve better anti-XA activity without reaching therapeutic levels. Now unfractionated heparin um, uh, uh, preferences are preferred in high risk patients during the peripartum period due to its shorter half life, quick monitoring, its effect on APTT and easy reversibility. Now salient of other pharmacotherapeutic agents are the fondoparinics. It is a pentasaccharide, it crosses the placenta, safety not completely established during pregnancy but however considered safe during breastfeeding and used in patients with serious heparin induced thrombocytopenia or allergies to heparin. Vitamin K antagonists like warfarin crosses the placenta and can cause fetal structural defects and that is warfarin embryopathy. That includes nasal hypoplasia, scoliosis and schizencephaly in a dose dependent manner when exposed in the early first trimester. Its use in the second and third trimesters can lead to behavioral and cognitive deficiencies and may also lead to intracranial hemorrhage in the fetus during the peripartum period not contraindicated during breastfeeding. Now direct oral anticoagulants not preferred during pregnancy as their safety is not well established. What could be the strategies for thromboprophylaxis in pregnancy and puerperium? Most countries including India have opted for the RCOG recommendations that stresses on pharmacological prophylaxis with a significant effect on reducing maternal and perinatal morbidity and mortality as part of their safe motherhood initiatives. This is also an extremely important slide that I would like you to concentrate on. You will see that there are different colors here for the risk factors for the venous thromboembolism. If you look at the factors on the left hand side for previous venous thromboembolism except a single event related to a major surgery the uh, marks given here is a score of 4. So wherever you look at all the kind of uh, you know factors that they have put on the left side they have given a score of 4, 3, 2 and 1. So if you are given a total score and depending on the kind of score that you actually get you have to understand that you either go in for a prophylactic thromboprophylaxis or you go for early mobilization. So there is no such thing as you will go for thromboprophylaxis in every case. So this chart itself 
will be a guidance for you as to how to take it forward. The left hand side will show the first one is the pre-existing risk factors, the second one is the obstetric risk factors, the third one is the transient risk factors. So, keeping all this in mind and the scores have been given on the right hand side. So, having given the scores on the right hand side, you will see that all these things have got marks here and if this marks tell you that the obstetric thromboprophylaxis risk assessment and management will tell you any previous uh, uh, venous thromboembolism except a single event related to a major surgery, it is considered a high risk requires antenatal prophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin and referred to trust nominated thrombosis in pre-pregnancy expert team. So, that means it has to be taken on high priority. The intermediate would be the hospital admissions and therefore, that considers that is considered as an intermediate risk consider antenatal prophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin. The third category with the obesity and the other factors that are I put below and that would be four or more risk factors in this category uh, prophylaxis from the first trimester and three risk factors prophylaxis from over 28 weeks. So, fewer than three risk factors would mean lower risk and mobilization and avoidance of dehydration is what one has to be looking for. So, keeping that in mind you have to understand that these sort of things should be kept in mind that the contraindications and cautions that one would actually take in a case of low molecular weight heparin use. Contraindications and cautions to low molecular weight heparin use are known bleeding disorders, active antenatal or postpartum bleeding, women considered at increased risk of major hemorrhage, thrombocytopenias, acute stroke in previous 4 weeks several renal disease and severe li uh, liver disease, uncontrolled hypertension that is blood pressures of over 200 systolic and over 120 diastolic. Clinical and laboratory thresholds are taken from the Department of Health guidelines based on evidence from the non-pregnant population. Anesthesia consideration spinal and epidural, the catheter has to be placed about 12 hours after the last dose of low molecular weight heparin, restart low molecular weight heparin at least 6 hours after the removal of the catheter, extended caution to be exercised in patients who are on aspirin or clopidogrel and NSAIDs as they may worsen bleeding episodes. Now looking at thromboprophylaxis in gynec practice, pre-existing and patient related risks are patients over the age of 60 years and dehydration, immobility and sepsis, past history of family history of venous thromboembolism, hereditary thrombophilias, autoimmune disorders including APLA, exposure to hormone therapy mostly estrogens. So, general conditions for thromboprophylaxis would be low molecular weight heparin preferred dosage would be enoxapyrin 40 milligrams subcutaneously once a day or daltipyrin 5000 units subcutaneously once a day. The weight based adjustments to be considered for dosing restart low molecular weight heparin about 6 to 12 hours after surgery, low molecular weight heparin to be continued till the patient is fully ambulant. 5 weeks after thromboprophylaxis, it is recommended for post cancer related surgeries, 7 to 10 days of thromboprophylaxis is recommended for other major surgeries. Mechan mechanical prophylaxis and intermittent pneumatic compression could be considered. Graduated compression stockings could be used as adjuvant therapy. Now, thromboprophylaxis recommendations as per risk stratification, thromboprophylaxis risk stratification categorized as high risk, moderate risk and low risk. So, for the high risk it would be thromboprophylaxis, for moderate risk to consider thromboprophylaxis and for the low risk early 
mobilization. So comparing the guidelines in all these cases whilst the guidelines are very complicated here on the slide it's very simple it's actually all the guidelines put together you can have a look at all these guidelines but basically it will give you an idea that most of these cases are classified into high medium and low risks so you can follow any of these guidelines so in summary risk stratification and customization is the basis for deciding therapy and guidelines could be supportive. Patient counseling and participation in management decisions is pivotal. The patient must be told what she could expect and why she should take these medications. Benefits of preventing venous thromboembolism and its complications should outweigh risks of bleeding. High quality research essential to fill significant voids in treatment protocols. So, with all this, I would like to say that thromboembolism is no longer a rare entity. It is a entity that is fairly common but comes so suddenly that you would not be expecting it. It is something almost like an ectopic pregnancy. You will always say it does not happen to me but you will sometimes be caught with it. So, it is important to be put into your diagnostic armamentarium and to say that if there is any person who is obese where there is immobilization and is there a history of embolus in the family I think these people should be considered. So, a very effective history is important and also to be made sure that even if you do not find any kind of signs like a Homan sign etc. The thrombus could be at a higher position. Imagine if you say that you do not diagnose a thrombus and you do not see the typical kind of inflammation and swelling and edema of the legs. Please be under no uh, kind of calm serene kind of atmosphere because these thrombus can actually break away and go into the lungs and the person could be dead in no time. So, before you are going to be sorry about it, be safe, be very protective, be prophylactic, try and identify these situations, be very careful also of the preconditions in which you should actually use thromboprophylaxis. I have also given you a summary of who are the people and what are the doses that has to be given and this is going to be a very important document for you to keep at your clinic bedside so that even the juniors who are going to treat your patients at night and look after them should be aware to keep in mind that these things can happen and timely administer the low molecular weight heparin or heparin is unfractionated heparin because this could save the life of the patient. Thank you very much for listening to this and I am very happy that you people have had a very good talk. I am very happy to say that I have enjoyed this lecture as well. Thank you.